you think? Call of Cthulhu Dark Corners of the Earth is a fascinating game. It's memorable, atmospheric, immersive, with a distinct gameplay style. Yet there is plenty of jank, ebbs and flows in quality, and the game pulling itself in many directions. An end result of a long, difficult development that reduced its ambitious scope. Yet the end result is something with plenty of love. There are a few games that scratch an itch that Dark Corner does. Say, last to raw of the sixth generation of gaming. The last stretch before budgets and team sizes blew up where publishers took less risks. Which is too bad because we need more games like Dark Corners of the Earth. Let's take a look at why. Limbs from out of town can leave a horrid mess. <laughs> Dark Corners of the Earth uses the works of H.P. Lovecraft. It takes elements of the Shadow Over Inns myth and some of his other works. The game also uses the Call of Cthulhu tabletop RPG, pulling from the campaign Escape from Innsmouth. These RPG elements, they're not present. They were planned though. Dark Corners of the Earth had a rocky development before seeing its release in late October of 2005. Initial screenshots from developer Headfirst Productions popped up in early 2000. The game would go through many iterations. The release version stripped down to something minimal in its scope. There were going to be up to four characters to play as. Going solo, the computer would control them. Else, you could play with friends. Campaign was going to be co-op, and deathmatch was going to be a thing as well. There were also going to be RPG elements that ended up getting cut. In mid-2000, Head First terminated their publishing deal with Ravensburger Interactive for breach of contract. In May of 2003, they struck a publishing deal with Bethesda. PS2 version was scrapped. Xbox would get the first released, followed by a PC port. This PC port released in March of 2006. Only one developer worked on the port as the company was filing for bankruptcy. Surprise, surprise, it was super buggy. Fan patches saved the day. Steam version is still more or less fucked. It was a bit ahead of the curve with being buggy on release. Remember when that was the exception and not the norm? If you're going to play it now, get the GOG version. It crashed only once on me here. Now, before we move forward, we have to discuss the elephant in the room. We need to discuss some uncomfortable truths about HP Lovecraft. That being, how much Mark Zuckerberg looks like him. I mean, look at this. Are they related? Mr. Meta seems like someone or something beyond our comprehension with his behavior. Today we got a brisket on the big guy and some pork ribs uh, on, on I, I, am, I am not the lizard. Um. On to the game. We're playing as Jack Walters, Private Eye. The game starts in Lovecraftian fashion, with Jack taking his own life in asylum in the year of 1922. <laughs> How did we end up here? Let's rewind the clock back to 1915. Jack comes to investigate a cult that are asking for him. The police have their place of worship surrounded. Nothing goes to plan in a gunfight in sights with the cult against the police. Jack is awfully calm about the whole thing, even more so as we are not armed. It does feel a bit odd. We're free to move around at our leisure despite this gunfight. Seems like a case of we gotta hook the player right away, even more odd considering how long we end up going without a gun. If we arrived at the scene after the gunfight and the police let Jack know the cult has been watching us, that could have worked. Why do these strange cultists care about Jack when he has never met them before? Ah, we've been expecting you to come up. It's an interesting mystery that gets tucked away until the game's ending. Jack talks plenty, but mainly through prompts in the environment, like a point and click title. He's not just commenting on everything we see as you expect in modern games. These books are really old, and most of them are in strange languages I don't understand. This is a fantastic prelude, and hell, we haven't even arrived in Innsmouth yet. <gasps> ah! 
And it's off to Arkham Asylum. No, not the one where Batman's foes get sent to for Jack for six years. He comes to with no memory of what happened after that incident. Back to work, Walters takes a case of a missing person in Innsmouth. This stretch of arriving and wandering around Zinsmith, ah, chef's kiss. But what about Trey? Surely the port needs business. Innsmouth has the means to look after him home. They nailed the atmosphere of an unwelcoming town hiding some secret. Within one month, we got this, we got condemned, and we got fear. Games with some of the best atmospheres around. It also helps with the Yanis are the locals. Many have what's known as the Innsmouth look. Something isn't right about them. The voice acting adds to this. It comes very close to falling into what I consider cheesy, but instead it adds to that unwelcoming, uneasy feeling. Innsmouth don't take too kindly to them from out of town. Get lost, stranger. And I'm Constable Burke, and I'm the law around these parts, and I'm still not talking to you. Now get by. There are some helpful citizens, but they're either drunks or scared. There's plenty of harm. It's not wise to be seen gossiping with outsiders. Oh, can you spare a few pennies, young mister? I can give you something for your generosity. There's a couple of aspects about doors and dark corners that I haven't seen pop up in other games. One is how Jack will back away or towards when opening or closing a door. A small but appreciated detail in first person. Although sometimes this would lead him to moving to one side of a door or closing when I wanted the other side. We could also bolt some doors. Even if it's a small thing, it adds so much tension and urgency to stressful sections. I love to see other games make use of this. There is no quick saving in dark corners of the earth. Save points are plenty, until they're not. There are a few frustrating stretches where another save point would have been nice in between. We get these cuts to someone or something watching us from their perspective. These can cause quite a startle if you're not prepared. Our investigation takes us to the Waite family, where tragedy strikes. Innsmouth is more unwelcoming by the minute. In regards to puzzles in dark corners, they're usually quick affairs. Discern something from a journal entry to find a combination. A game highlight is the chase sequence, the one that everyone remembers. Even those who haven't played the game may know of this part. What makes this chase scene work so well? Well, it has great build up to it. It's been building since Jack first arrived in town. The sound design is amazing. The barking, the banging, the music. Curtis, it's locked. Probably bolted on the other side. He's awake in there. I can hear him moving about. Break the door down, you damn fool. Hurry up. Quick, I see you. Don't have to wait. Check the door. And there's not a lot going on here. And what do I mean by that? Look at most modern game chase sequences. You often involve the player holding forward as explosions go off around them. Visually dense, it's a blur and you forget about it. Rarely do they get any build to them. That isn't the case here. You could follow what's going on. This game makes wonderful use of the mechanic of bolting doors. Get that door bolted as you hear them pounding away to get in. Push some shelves in front of the doors. You gotta think on your feet and act quick. It's wonderful and well remembered for a reason. Innsmouth has turned from unwelcome to hostile. With that, let's look at some of the other game mechanics present. Like stealth, it's very bare bones, in a good way. Ah, uh, the days before detection meters, sight indicators, or seeing through walls. We're relying on audio cues and barks from enemies. The damage system in dark corners of the earth is unique. Depending on gunshot wounds or falls, we'll take damage in different areas of the body. We'll find a variety of health kit items to heal a specific wound. An attack may cause damage to several places. It takes time to heal. It doesn't take place in the menu. You have to plan it out. It can create a lot of tension. Are you safe for now? Can you get that heal off in time? Are you hidden? Heal now or after this fight? It's possible that you may bleed out if you don't heal on time, which is a nice touch. It is a different system with good execution that helps the game stand out. But now we're also introduced to the enemy AI. Oh boy, it's notable, but for all the wrong reasons. Although there is some janky charm as a result, like how you'll shoot them where you might miss them and they'll be like, did you hear something? But let's hold off for now. We're still weaponless. Dark Corner shows plain restraint before handing us a gun. There are great sections of trying to find your way out while surrounded by enemies. Less about stealth and more about navigating through your environment. 
In another universe, this game was a full-on stealth and platforming puzzles. I was never thinking, when does the shooting begin? Give me a damn gun already. A trip to the sewers takes us closer to creatures unknown, something lurking beneath the surface. This is where another mechanic, the sanity system, starts to kick in. So if there's a game made for having sanity effects, it's one based on the world of Lovecraft. And here it's okay, but it could have been so much more, to a point. I recently did a video on Eternal Darkness. It's well known for its sanity system that messes with the player. Nintendo had a patent on the system used there and proceeded to never use it for another title. So what does the system here entail? Well, faster, louder heartbeat, sound will fade out, voices, a blurry screen like you're drunk, which is okay, but it could have been so much more if they had the ability to go crazy with it like an eternal darkness. Plus, we're in first person here, so things could have gotten really interesting. Here's an idea the team had back when multiplayer was still a thing. Depending on their sanity, one player may see a monster when they are actually human. More sane player would still see a human. Damn you, Nintendo. To note, the patent on the sanity system recently expired, so game devs go replay Eternal Darkness and go crazy with it. We find the missing man we came to find. Now we also have access to guns. And this is where, surprise surprise, the game takes a bit of a tumble quality wise. Downed enemies don't drop ammo and will disappear on death. Bit of an immersion breaker. But like everything else, combat is quite minimal and does carry a lot of weight. We can't see how much ammo we have. A well placed shot will take down an enemy. On the other end, a well-placed shot by them can be quite deadly even on the default difficulty. Combat can be very high stakes, which I approve of. Too bad the enemy AI is quite iffy, although it can create some amusing situations. Like why are they standing here? Is this some strategy that's beyond a human's comprehension? So we had a great chase scene prior, now we get one that's not so great. We're making a run at getting out of town in a truck, we're shooting from the back. A preview of what was to come, the rise of set pieces and chase sequences during the 7th generation of gaming. What follows is one of the worst sections of the game. A woman is trapped above as goons swarm in. It's easy to get cornered, we only just obtained firearms before this. It's one of those things that feels like a higher up or a publisher mandated more combat. And you don't need to save her, and even if you do, she dies right after. Okay, so in a Lovecraft story, I could understand this. But could this have waited a little longer and could have been more than just a car flipping over? We take a trip back to the asylum after the escape. Throughout the game, we have flashbacks to them. One of our allies we came across prior with in Innsmouth was a man named Mackie. He mentions J. Edgar Hoover, which got a chuckle out of me. A few years back, some new hotshot was made head of the FBI. His name's Hoover. He's on a personal mission to wipe crime from this country. And then J. Edgar Hoover himself shows up asking us about Innsmouth. And I don't care for your opinions, whoever the hell you are. J. Edgar Hoover from the Bureau. And considering your position, Mr. Walters, you best mind your manners. Now we're working with him in raiding Innsmouth. Things are getting pretty out there, and we haven't even dug below the surface yet. So this starts with raiding the refinery. I do like this section, even if it feels a bit of a place in the game itself. Enemies are not in packs here, but spread out. Gunfights work well in one-on-one -on -one encounters. It's not linear, but loops around with shortcuts by unlocking bolts. The music is quite foreboding. Something lurks beneath the surface here. Although it suffers from a section with respawning enemies. Luckily, you can exploit that AI or just run away. And Hoover getting captured in a cage, being slowly dropped to his death? It's pretty goofy and cartoonish. Like he could slip between the bars. You're J. Edgar Hoover. After you've watched your copper friend here die, I'm coming after you! Shoot him! Shoot the screwy bastard! Now we have the Shogath encounter. We've heard about them. We know they've been lurking. Now we come face to face with some of these creatures. The section works quite well. We're a plaything for it. We're an area that loops on itself. A firefight won't work, so we'll need to solve some environmental puzzles to deal with it. Of course, looking at it isn't the best for our sanity. As the raid continues, we get this eh set piece of running along ice. Am I playing Call of Duty here? Remember back then, the series was only at two titles. Luckily, the next section, The Order's Mansion, is fantastic. Enemies are far apart, there's verticality in a confined area. There's some looping design with plenty of shortcuts to unlock. We can use items we've had in our inventory for ages. And that atmosphere. We're on the cusp of discovering something below the surface. Something dark and far beyond our understanding. The constant chanting nails this fact home. <laughs> Not 
Afterwards, we're seabound, and the ship has its moments, but it's also where some of the worst elements of Dark Corners pops up. This section can be very frustrating, trial and error, where things become very script heavy. It starts great, something isn't quite right here, the tension builds, and here come the deep ones. who get gunned down with East, but pour out numbers. They're cannon fodder. You could gun them down as fast as townsfolk with a well-placed shot. The tension gets sucked right out of the room, or the ship as a result. The section where we're running from them, locking bolts behind us, much better. This is what the section should have been for this stretch. And then we fight Dagon. <laughs> Thank God for this gun on board. Hold on, taking on Dagon by ourselves? I've read Lovecraft, but I'm not an expert in the lore. Shouldn't the sight of Dagon be enough to drive Jack to the brink? We're just a little pest to him. The game had plenty of tension as is. Seeing Dagon, I have no problem with that. Fighting Dagon, that sounds like a bit much. While it's a straightforward fight, I'll give it credit for the spectacle that it is. Devil's Reef is our final stop. The stretch on the surface is a nice palate cleanser, a stretch without combat. Underground will get caught and have to stealth it for a while. This section is quite frustrating. There's less in the environment to hide behind, environments are less dense. It's more about timing guards routes along with trial and error. Things are far apart here, compared to the refinery or mansion which pack together its sections. This leads to some excessive backtracking and padding especially when stealth is your only option until you find your weapons. Although the atmosphere is still on point. And we have this boss fight with the leader of the order. Sure, he's wounded, but shouldn't he be a bit more powerful and be able to take us down with East with his abilities? I mean, a basic goon can do a quicker job than him. And then we receive this Yithian power weapon. It could wipe the floor with goons. Hey, it's the end stretch, I'm good with that. Just prior to facing the Hydra, we'll have a fight with a couple of these flying creatures. That energy weapon we found, it was a weapon for dealing with these creatures made untold years ago. While straightforward, it is an exhilarating fight. To cap things off, it's time to deal with Hydra. There's much more to this fight than with Dagon. It is cool to control a deep one for a period of time. Sure, it's a video gamey boss fight, but at least it's not strafe around and shoot them. Although escaping from these caves drove me up the wall. Was that what they were trying to go for here? Trying to cause insanity in the player? Depending on the percentage of completion, the more the ending explains. That six year stretch Jack doesn't remember, he was one of the Yith. Those cultists at the beginning, they're worshiping Yith, so that's why they know us. Jack's mind gets white for his own safety, but he was able to remember some moments as a yith which pop up throughout the game. It's why he was able to see from the perspective of others throughout the game. I always appreciate the narrative explaining a gameplay mechanic. Our story ends where it began with Jack taking his own life. And so ends Dark Corners of the Earth. It's an exhilarating, if jumbled game. Part adventure, part FPS, feels pulled in many different directions. It wears its troubled development on its sleeve. Some sections knock out of the park, some strike out. While it's gained a following over time, it was a commercial flop at release. Head first lost Bethesda as a publisher. They had a couple of Lovecraft titles in the pipeline. Sadly, they were unable to find another publisher and dissolved in 2006. I would have loved to see how those have turned out taking what they learned from Dark Corners and feedback from players. Alas, that was not to be. There's something special about Dark Corners of the Earth, rough edges and all. Even if pulled in many different directions, there are few games like it. As far as atmosphere goes, few games do it better. We need more games like this. Although, let's make sure the AI behaves a bit better. Did you hear that? Although, some jank is fine. Thanks for watching. Do all those things YouTube algorithm likes. If you'd like to support the channel further, check out my Patreon and become a YouTube member. Thanks everyone. Boulder Punch out. Oh, you didn't shrink. No, no, we were bold and brave. 
And we love the fights in the wild midnight in the storm of the mountain wave. The timbers creak and the sea birds shriek. There's lightning, young, young blast. Hard to leave what map renders, for the storm is gathering fast.